Where should we begin? How controversial do we begin? Huh? You want to say something? Go ahead. What do you want to say? Huh? Yeah, but uh, listen, you may have something more controversial than what I'm going to bring up. The, the more controversial, the better from my point of view. Um, yes. Even though I said I was going to do it afterwards, let's, let's see what, uh, what, what the audience has to say. Go ahead. Hello. It's not really controversial, but I was pondering okay. it for a long time. It's about the korbanot. And about the korbanot? Yeah. It's such a big uh, part of the Jewish tradition. Yet it seems so strange that okay. uh, by uh, sacrificing as an animal, it will uh, change something. I know that today we say korbanot with our lips and uh, by saying them actually. So I thought maybe in the time of Mashiach, the korbanot that we will offer will be our animal desires. And I didn't know if that's the direction it's going to go. Okay. Got it. Everybody heard that? Okay. It's, a, it's actually one of the questions that's asked. It is controversial, actually. It's not controversial in the sense of, it's not a sensitive topic, but it's a topic which, um, let's, let's begin with that. Why not? Um, I'll repeat it, yeah. The question is about karbonot, the animal sacrifices or offerings that we find in the Torah, different holidays every day for uh, atonement, for this purpose, for that purpose. So, especially in our day and age where there's the environmental consciousness and you even have all these groups of animal rights. We had one in Crown Heights every, before Yom Kippur with the chickens. Um, so the question is, how do you explain this in a humane way, in a decent way, that we take actual animals, seemingly innocent animals, and we sacrifice them for what? To protect ourselves? I mean, what, what, where's the, the justification for that? The animal did no wrong. I mean, you didn't say that. I'm just embellishing a bit. And it seems especially odd in our day and age, you know, animal sacrifices. I mean, they come to a temple and it's full of blood. I'm not going to go into all the gory details. I will say this, since you mentioned it, a few years ago, a New York Times writer wanted to come to uh, Crown Heights. He wanted to cover the topic of Mashiach, which... Uh, has its own controversies. And uh, he asked me, when would it be a good time to come? So I said to him, Simchas Beis HaSheva is the best time. Sukkot night, Jews from all over come and they dance in the streets. I thought it would be very good because then, you know, everybody's acting crazy, so that would look good, you know. Um, but he decided to come, 12 o'clock midnight, I get a phone call, my cell phone, the night before Yom Kippur. The night before Erev Yom Kippur, I should say. And he says to me, hey, I'm here in town, Crown Heights. I'm at President and Kingston. And there's a lot of chickens here. Maybe you, you, why don't you come over? You know, they're, they're, they're running loose. I said, oh, boy. <laughs> anyway, I got over there. And I don't know if you ever saw this scene. It's some, something to behold. Chickens all over the place. And then there's the shechting of it. I mean, I, it's not so easy to explain <laughs> to someone who doesn't know. <laughs> to the uninitiated, let's put it this way. And he said to me, hey, there's a chicken. This chicken got loose. Don't ask. It looked like... It, it, and then he said to me, okay, so what time are they going to bring out the goats and the cows? You know, you know he's sort of like a, some type of bl uh, black magic. And we're going to do this like midnight rituals of... I mean, it was... Uh, and then I remember he said this now. He's a very intelligent guy. He said to me, Mashiach, Mashiach is a beautiful concept, utopia. I can understand that. But, but uh, slaughtering chickens at 1 o'clock in the morning and President at Kingston? He says, that's a problem. <laughs> so just for those that have issues, <laughs> I'm just uh, elaborating a bit. Um, I'll answer the question with another question. So I'm like answering two questions. And I remember this very vividly. It was a question that people ask, especially vegetarians and vegan, who ask the question, what right do we have to kill an animal to eat it? We'll get back to the sacrifices. Let's, let's make, broaden the question. What right do we have to do that? Animals have a life. Why, how can we disrupt their trajectory, their life, because, because we're hungry? Now, I have to tell you a story that really, a real true story. It was not, I was giving a class in Manhattan, Upper West Side, and before the class, so, and people came from all the places, and, and there was one particular person who I saw who came with an agenda. And even before I opened my mouth, 
he says, I need to ask you something because I need to know if I'm going to stay in this class or not. Like he was like testing me. He says, um, what, what did he tell me? He said, this question. He said, yeah, you eat meat? I said, from time to time. He says, How, what right do you have to kill an animal for you to, consume, for you to indulge yourself? And it was a very, you know, comf- you know, he was not looking for an answer. He just wanted to make a point. So I don't know what got into me. I usually never do this. So I said to him, I just felt, you know, he like uh, provoked me and he was like being, he was like uh, being nasty. So I said to him, what do you think about a vegetarian that beats his wife? That's literally what I said. And I remember he went crazy. He went ballistic. He stormed out. The guy who brought him stormed out. We went with him. And later I found out that he's both. So I don't know, God put the right words in my mouth. So in other words, you're very sensitive to animals, but you forgot to be sensitive to your own spouse and to your children. And you didn't even realize the hypocrisy. Now, there's still not an answer to the question, mind you, but it was interesting that this, I don't know, I, that's what I said. <laughs> I must not expect that it happened. And la- later, by the way, he met me again and uh, he apologized because he wasn't a very angry place and he, he needed his own help. So I'm not validating his question, but you have to also put things into context. So it's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. But I have to tell you a story with the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe was sitting at a table, a Shabbos table, and there was someone sitting there who was vegetarian, was not eating from the meat. So the Rebbe Rashab, someone told the Rebbe Rashab, he's a vegetarian. So the Rebbe Rashab said, and what's going on in the world of, the, of vegetation, he does, he, he does know what's going on in the world of vegetation. That was the Rebbe Rashab's expression. What does that mean? And why don't you ask the question, how can you eat a vegetable or an apple or an orange? Oh, because they don't shed blood? But how do you know? Maybe we don't understand their language. They also have a family. And what about the mineral world? Why did you suddenly decide to be sensitive to the animals? Why not to everything? So someone will say, listen, then I'll die. I have to eat something. Is that an answer? That's not a justification. And actually, this question is asked in, in Kabbalistic texts and in Hasidus. What right do we have to touch even a mineral, not just an animal? And there's only one answer that we have. And that is that the one who created it all gave us that right. But not a right. It's actually an obligation. And this is the answer. The Mishnah says in Sanhedrin, in the Talmud, asks the question, why was the young human being created last? If the human being is the crown jewel of creation, the one that's meant to elevate and refine the universe, so why was the human being created last? He should be created first. And the the Mishnah gives two answers, seemingly contradictory answers. One is because when you set a table and you invite guests, you don't first bring the guests to the table. You first set the table and everything is prepared. Then comes the guest. So God prepared the entire world. And then the guest arrives. Second answer is given that in case a human being misbehaves, the Torah tells us, don't think you're so special. Even an insect was created before you. Even the lowly mosquito, Zvuv, Yitush, was created before you. Now, the first answer is you're the crown jewel, you're the great guest. The second is that you're less even inferior to an insect. How do you explain it? Very obvious, the Hasidic expression that when a wicked person walks on the street, the cobblestones cry out, what right do you have to walk and tread on me? I never transgressed God's will, and you did. What right do you have to step on me, wicked man? In other words, we were created and put into this sacred universe to elevate it. And if we indulge, even walking with our foot on a stone, we don't have a right to do that. Because why should the stone bear our, bear our, bear our uh, footprints when the stone never did anything wrong. So look at it this way. You're hungry. You're walking in a field. You're really hungry and thirsty. You see a juicy uh, apple. If you don't like apples, just replace it with a fruit you do like. I'm just making that point in case... Because uh, I once gave a talk about it. Someone said to me, why apple? I hate apples. So I said, it's not the point. It's the oranges. I hate oranges too. Can you find something you like? You know, whatever. I'm just making that point because it can be clear. Um, it's not like uh, discriminating against non-apple eaters or something. Um, 
talking about being sensitive, right? <laughs> so, okay, so you're really hungry and you can't wait to take that apple, juicy apple. And you gobble it down and now you're refreshed and that's that. How does the Torah look at that? That looks like you did something. What right is because you're hungry? Why should the apple suffer because you're hungry? However, if you made a blessing on the apple and you ate it and the energy you gained from it, you did, you used to do a mitzvah to help another person and the apple thanks you because while it was hanging on the tree, you could never help another person. And now that it became your flesh and blood and you did a good deed, the apple becomes part of your good deed. And if you do, God forbid, a bad deed, then the apple becomes part of your bad deed and you have no right to destroy another life for your indulgence. That's how Judaism thinks. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Chabad Rebbe, was a little child who was walking with his father in the woods. They were taking a walk with his father, Rabbi Shalom de Ber, the Rebbe Rashab. And the little boy, Rabbi Yisuf Yitzhak, the Rebbe, would later be the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe's father-in-law, tore off a leaf from a tree and began to rub it. You know, nonchalantly just rubbing it. And the Rebbe Rashab reprimanded him with a long talk and said, what right do you have to interfere with the trajectory and the journey of that leaf. That's the sensitivity we have, Torah has. Baal you can't destroy even one fiber of existence. The only right you have is because you were sent to this world to be the crown jewel and to take the world and make it a better place. And then all of creation thanks us because we're not destroying, we're elevating. You know, the word carbon is not translated correctly. Sacrifice is not the word carbon. Carbon means offering. As a matter of fact, it comes from the word kiruv, to bring closer. So the commentaries explain, and especially the Kabbalistic and, and Hasidic texts, that it's elevating. So you'll say, why does it have to come in the shape of killing? Maybe it's not called killing. Maybe it is just a matter of transforming something into a greater place. So that's the general gist of it. So if you do the right thing, then you're the crown jewel and greater than all of the world. But if you misbehave, you're, you're even more inferior to an insect because an insect has not transgressed. So that's the general answer to the idea that we don't have a right to touch not mineral, not vegetable, not animal, and definitely not in the context of offerings. Our job is to elevate. Now, there's more to be said on it, but I don't want to just dwell on one question. The point I mostly want to make, that even if you have questions on my answer, there's more thought than this than you think. True Judaism talks about this at length. It's not just dismissive. On the contrary, I would like to see the greatest environmentalists of our time, do they have the sensitivity to a leaf that the Torah has? And the fact that many of us uh, don't have that sensitivity, that's simply our callousness. That's not what's expected of us. Okay, so it really comes down to why... The world, why these items in the world were created in the first place, and when you'd use them for which they were created, then it's actually you're fulfilling their purpose and not destroying it. Um, so what do you, so what do, you do? Because we don't have that much time, maybe I should take questions. You know, I, I, there's a lot of ways to go here. I see a few people raise their hands. Why don't we just take questions from the room here? So, you know. Watching the news, and I, didn't, I wasn't able to hear your Trump talk. It was standing room, and I couldn't stand for all that time. But um, I see there's a lot of... Uh, shutdown of questions in our society. Like um, there are conservative speakers who are not allowed to speak on campus. We have in California Ben Shapiro. He was supposed to speak um, in Berkeley. At this point, I don't think he's going to be able to speak. So I wanted to hear your opinion about you know what's going on. Also, a little subcategory of that is how I see Jews are afraid to talk to each other about who they voted for. I don't know if you covered that yesterday. Well, what is your question to me? So, oh, well, um, how, do, how can families get along if we've got such, uh, like, right and wrong? And I, and I can't imagine that you would have, like, uh, my brother said to me, Sharon, you voted for Obama, didn't you? And because uh, there are a lot of very, there are a lot of Jews have been liberal over a period of uh, many years. And uh, I, 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 did, I felt like closed down altogether when I'm in a group and I say, no, I didn't. 
So I. Uh, you asked me know. how do, do you we have, get along when we have different opinions? Yeah, and we don't, and we allow each other to be an individual and ourselves. And I don't know if you can. Okay, I got the question. It was that. actually my, a big part of my talk yesterday in the Trump talk. Those of you, some of you were there. Anybody was there from there? Okay. I said I don't want to really repeat it all because it's first of all recorded and you could hear it. But I'll just say one thing: this isn't just about politics. How about in general a family, let's say, that has a disagreement? How do you disagree in a healthy way? I have brothers and sisters. I don't agree with everything. So I think that, unfortunately, we have uh, lost, so many of us have lost or never learned the art of disagreeing with someone without personalizing it. You know, everything becomes personal, and I think it's part of maybe the psychological state. People are insecure. Like, you have to be wrong for me to be right. What's the logic in that? I can be right, and you don't have to be wrong for me to be right. We can dis agree to disagree. And I think that is the heart, in my opinion, of this question. It's not about politics, it's about everything. Love is unconditional. You, you can love someone that you don't necessarily agree with. Since when is agreement a prerequisite for caring about each other? Now, I grew up in an environment like that, so maybe to me it comes natural and I find it surprising when I see otherwise. And that doesn't mean we all can get trapped in pettiness. But step back and ask yourself that question. Don't blame the other. Let's say, look at yourself and ask yourself a simple question. Why am I angry at somebody that, that disagrees with me? Why am I angry? Why, why do you have to be angry? You can, I, I have my position. I feel they're wrong. You want to make a case for it by all means. And that's that. You either will make a case and persuade the other person or you won't. But why do you carry it? Why is it personalized? Why is it like if that person disagrees with me, that means they invalidate me. Or when we disagree with someone, we have to invalidate them. Why do you have to invalidate them? Jews always knew. Even our greatest enemies, and they were real enemies, our job was not to invalidate them. Our job was to protect ourselves. But we didn't have to personalize it. Even with the Nazis, and I'm, nothing I'm saying here in any way defends Our attitude, as I said yesterday in my talk about Trump, our revenge is building our families. Our revenge is our children and our grandchildren. We don't need to get even with them. What, are we going to go to Germany and bomb all their cafes, even though their children and grandchildren are alive and kicking? It's not the Jewish way. It's not because we're afraid to do that, because what are we getting from that? So the bottom line is, you can disagree with someone. It does not have to in any way invalidate. I'm sure you've met some people like that. Maybe you haven't. And maybe you should. So that's how I see it. When I see a family or friends that suddenly become... Um, angry at each other because of a disagreement, it's not the disagreement. It means they have issues with interacting, coexisting, confidence, security, and so on. I don't know if this is a platform here for us to be able to go through the whole therapeutic needs to be able to get to a place like that, but that's how I respond. And, and I would say you need to go, not only you or whoever, needs to go and speak to people who can look deeper at what's really going on here. Yes, next question. Can we go here? Uh, who? Okay, go ahead. I'm just going, we'll, we'll try, I'll try to cover as I, everyone that I can. I, go ahead. I try to be short. Uh, uh, Rabbi David Aaron yesterday said that uh, God, we have to be open. God will implant into us what he wants. Now, what if that is evil? Like so many people do a lot of evil. How do I know whether that's what he wants or whether I should go against that grain. I mean, it perplexed me. Rephrase the question. I'm not, I didn't understand. Okay, good. Rabbi Aaron, yesterday, he gave in 50 minutes a summary of uh, Zohar, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. Okay. One of the things, he started with saying that God will implant in you, you have to be a landing pad for his will. For what? For his will? For the, God's will. Okay. Okay. Now, what if that means I have to do bad things, even evil things? Should I then say, okay, that's God's will, I'm going to do it? Out of respect to Rabbi Aaron, I would submit the question to him. Because I don't know the context of what he said. And I don't want to start guessing. He's here. I think you should ask him the question. Okay. Is that fair? Partially. Part, <laughs> why, why partially? I mean, I'm saying it out of respect because I don't know the context of the whole discussion here. Yeah, right. Obviously, the Torah does not say that we should uh, be doing something destructive. 
-hmm. God's will is to be constructive. So I'm not sure. Give me a scenario where this would be a problem. Okay. S scenarios. Um, he didn't give the scenario, but I could imagine that uh, I see a lot of poverty. Now I say, well, let's, let me rob the bank and hand out the money. So the Torah says that's forbidden, period. There's no ifs or buts. That's, a, that's not a justification acceptable, if that's a scenario. Not everything. You can't but the, well, okay, kill one that, person that, to save another person. Well, the thought I had is why does God allow someone like the evil one, Hitler or Stalin, do what he does? That's a very different question now, by the way. Completely different question. Okay, but that's what I wanted to get at. Oh, why God allows people to be evil? Well, million dollar question. There's a whole book of Job just on that question. But briefly, then the day God's value of our free will is more powerful than him intervening and stopping us from making mistakes. So free will, sadly, takes, includes the possibility of someone doing something really bad through their free will. So you have to really ask the question why God gave us free will, which is really why did God create us in the first place. That's the brief, shortest answer I can give to that question. Some food for thought. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. Let's hear something from the next generation. Um, all right. Um, so last week I went to my rabbi's house for a dinner, and he commonly plays a game called Stump the Rabbi, and he's actually over there. Stump the Rabbi? Yeah. Do you stump him? Uh, eh, not really, but... <laughs> so it's a setup. He's not. Does he really want to be stumped? Uh, uh, yeah. you know he's a pretty games. knowledgeable guy, though. <laughs> um, but last week I asked a question, and I wanted to hear your answer about it. Okay, um, what was it? How does modern science, like, interact with Judaism in the right way? So we, have, we fan, constantly we find, like, all these civilizations and new fossils every, almost every week. Um, how does Judaism, like, react to that? Okay, good. I'll repeat the question. The question is, how does Judaism um, uh, reconcile itself and deal with modern science, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with one example, let's say fo the fossil record that seems to indicate that the universe is a lot more than 5,777 years. Mm -hmm. that, that's your question, right? Yeah. Okay, great. You can sit down. I got it. Oh, you want to stand? You can stand. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad you're thinking about these things. I have a middle of answering a young man's question. I can, and my whole point was I cannot invalidate a question. So what are you going to do with that, Rabbi? Okay. So let me respond to the question briefly, again, because of time. And I, I want to say this to you and to everyone again. Excellent question, and keep asking questions, even if you don't get a full answer. That doesn't mean there isn't more to say. And I, as I said, we have to be brief. So briefly, this is how the Torah looks at it. There's only one God. God created the universe. He created the universe actually in a scientific way, in a logical way. And that's why science exists. If the world was not a rational place and didn't have any laws of nature, there would be no science. So science is essentially the study of God's mind, as Einstein put it. So there's no way that there can be a contradiction between God's mind in creating the nature and the natural phenomenon and all the laws of nature. It could be a contradiction to Torah, which is also God's mind teaching us how to behave. So essentially you can say science is the study of the mechanics of God's universe and Torah is the study of the morality of God's universe. Science is neutral. It's, a, it's amoral. A scientist cannot tell you, a scientist can tell you, let me analyze this uh, subatomic particle, this fossil, whatever it is. But a scientist is out of his league to say, do a mitzvah or don't, or don't, don't, don't behave unethically. Because it's not in the world of science. Torah is all about how to behave, how to use science, and how to use the world God gave us for making it a better place, for behaving more ethically, with virtue, with integrity, with truth, with truth. A scientist can be a liar. A, a Torah person can't. We all have free will. We make our mistakes. But the Torah says do not lie. And a scientist could be an unethical person. Bertrand Russell once said he behaved unethically. So they asked him, how could you behave unethically? You teach ethics to the university. So he said, I also teach mathematics and I'm not a triangle. You know? The Torah says... You have to be what you preach. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but we have to aspire to, to be proud and say, you know what? 
I can teach you about ethics, but I'm not ethical. That's not a Torah of language. So the Torah is about integration with a, a moral system. Science is about the study of the mechanics of the universe. It's two different worlds. It's apples and oranges. And from a Torah point of view, they're absolutely all compatible. The, God's mind cannot contradict God's mind. So if there's something that someone discovers in science today, and you say, one second, that seems to contradict the Torah idea, you either the science is wrong or you don't understand the Torah idea. That's the way we look at it. There cannot be a contradiction. Now, as far as fossils or other things, it's a rather longer discussion. There's many ways to understand it and look at it. You know, remember when Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, what did it look like? They saw big trees. They saw stars. So if you were there the first day of creation, the universe was in a mature universe. There were no little uh, plants. There were plants, but there were also big trees. There were stars. A star no means millions of miles of, of light years away. So the universe was created a mature universe. That's not a contradiction because that's how God wanted. He wanted to create a mature universe. Anyway, that's just a brief, as I said, very brief because of time limitations and uh, the, I don't want to call you the hangman, but the, 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 the not execution, the angel of uh, justice has arrived. There we go. That's a good way to put it. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone.